Kathleen. Karen. Happy anniversary to investigate. Thank you. You're not there anymore. No, I know. <laughs> I did my seven year stretch and. Uh, you got the seven year itch. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, that's a good way to put it, yeah. yeah. Well, well, we'll talk more about uh, your, your switching of careers in a bit. Sure. Um, I sort of wanted to, you know, I was sitting there and I was looking, I was like, I was doing recon and going online and like checking you out. And I saw, you went to Carleton University? I, I, uh, for a year. I finished my degree there. Absolutely. Was yeah. it journalism? No, you know, I, I went there because of their journalism program mm -hmm. and I actually had a housemate that was in the journalism program and so whenever they had any kind of a party or an event they were going to I would tag along so I almost did sort of like an informal auditing <laughs> but I finished my, an arts degree and I finished it in Ottawa uh, at the Capitol but it was really fun you know following her around she'd go to press conferences on the hill and uh, scrums in different places just to you know kind of get a feel for the job and and uh, I would tag along and then in the end she ended up going into public relations oh there you go oh waste of a journalist oh, oh we'll have to go throw rocks at her house later yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know I mean I have to had to unfriend her yeah. Yeah. but it would be great I'd have, she'd have a particularly interesting speaker in one day and I'd go to her room or because we lived in a uh, an old house on MacArthur in downtown Ottawa and it mm -hmm. used to be a boarding house a, like a rooming house guy bought it fixed it up there were about four suites per floor so there were like 12 students living in this house that all were going to university and working and um, uh, we each had like self-contained suites mm -hmm. and she was across the hall from me and so she'd leave her door open as a sign that hey come on over for tea or what and uh, we'll talk about uh, my day and so I'd go over and I'd hear who some of the interesting speakers were and then I'd just pump her full of questions so it was great. One night we spent there was a uh, uh, Corazon Aquino was being elected in the Philippines as the uh, overthrowing the Marcoses and uh, we spent stayed all uh, stayed up all night lying on the floor listening to the news on a radio and uh, just because it was we were both really interested in news um, uh, but uh, I was doing arts and she was doing going to go to PR so but uh, that was a really a great place to if, if you're interested in journalism to sort of and you know you worked there in Ottawa right yeah and I, I went to Carleton School of Journalism oh okay <laughs> that's All right. what I was so we're almost like alumni yeah 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 yeah, yeah. 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 I could compare notes which props were good <laughs> yeah, no. And I remember they had, I really enjoyed my year at Carleton. They had a lot of great uh, stuff. I joined the Amnesty International Club on campus. Oh, right, and right. Uh, uh, they had bands that would come and play. The Bangles came. <laughs> the Bangles came, the really? The Bangles came and played at Carleton University. Uh, yeah, it was, it was good times. Yeah, I think we had the bare naked ladies. See? Yeah, they, they did have good bet. You know, Carleton University, I don't know if it's related to the journalism school or not, but the ratio of bars to students <laughs> is the highest in the country. This is, this is a fact. Yes. This is a fact. Yes. I so uh, when, you, when you went there, so you're hanging around a journalist, but was that your intention that you were going to school to, to be a journalist? That's what well, you wanted to be when you grew up? Yeah, I always knew I wanted to be a reporter. Always. You always knew? I always knew. How did you always know? I don't know. It's just in my DNA somehow. Did you grow up like watching like Mary Tyler Moore or Murphy Brown? Yes. Or, yeah. Yes. And my parents were really, they were immigrants mm -hmm. and they were very much interested in news. Uh, we we kind of had, we were going to have supper, but it's like no news is coming on at six, right? On TV. Yeah. So we had to watch the news. So supper would wait. So we were a very, we both, we, we uh, subscribed to both newspapers in the city. I grew up in Winnipeg. Uh, we were just a very aware, newsy, conscious family. We had a lot of interesting debates. Um, and um, I always knew I wanted to do that, and my mom was very upset about it. My mom uh, tried very hard to change my mind. Why was she upset? She had a friend whose daughter worked at a newspaper and committed suicide. Oh. And so that I think we all know could happen no matter what you do for a living yeah but for my mom it was uh, I think just scared her so she had it and then this was the 70s 
um, I was finishing high school and telling her this is what I wanted to do, this is what I wanted to be. I loved writing. Um, and she, rec at that time, you could be a teacher or a nurse if you were a woman. Those mm. were sort of the, the two career paths that seemed acceptable at the time. I mean, if you were a teacher and you married a teacher, the, f the, f the female teacher had to quit her job. I mean, th this was in my lifetime. I remember uh, at Great West Life in Winnipeg, big insurance company, if uh, you married a male coworker there, you had to quit your job. The woman had to quit her job, you know? This I, I'll, I'll just put it out there. I went to my guidance counselor, and I, I mean, okay, I'm not, I'm old, but I'm not that old, okay? <laughs> I went to my guidance counselor, and I said, I want to I wanna do journalism, where should I study? And he's like, hmm, well, you could go to Ryerson, you could go to Carleton. If you go to Carleton, since your parents are in Ottawa, save them some money, but you should wait a few years because you're just taking a spot away from a man who could really use it, you're just gonna get married. Yep. And that, yeah, and that's a, probably a, one or two decades after me. I mean, you know, if you were gonna go to university at the time, it was to get your MRS, <laughs> to get your Mrs. designation, meet a guy, get married, have kids, don't even use your degree. So, uh, yeah, so my mom recruited my cousin to, who was, uh, had just finished nursing school to come over and give me the hard sell on becoming a nurse mm. and uh, just couldn't sway me and then of course tried my mom was a teacher so she tried to get me into education and I just I just wasn't interested and so it was one of many standoffs I've had with my mother <laughs> over the years <laughs> and uh, strong differences of opinion you know as you have with your parents about what you want to do right yeah. Well, I, I mean, you, you are a few years older than me, old enough to be an older sister, perhaps. Oh, aren't you nice. And, uh, you know, I no, because, I mean, I think uh, there doesn't have to be that much of a gap in age. Uh, you were the generation that was out there, like, punching that glass ceiling up mm -hmm. so that my generation could get up the next rung on the ladder. Absolutely. For Do sure. You, what, what, what was your experience going in? Because news was still pretty male dominated when you started. Yeah, and I started in newspapers. So kids just Google newspapers. Uh, it'll <laughs> show, <laughs> show you a picture and uh, should be on Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, I started in newspapers and um, uh, when I went to uh, one of them, I was the only female reporter. There were others, but they had moved on. So when I came, it was me and four or five other guys mm -hmm. until more w women came but it, it was often I would be in covering events uh, where I'd be the only woman in the room. I started in a small weekly in uh, rural Manitoba mm -hmm. and I covered a lot of agricultural um, issues and meetings especially in the winter when um, you know farmers aren't busy and they're talking about important issues and I would go into a, a hotel banquet room and it was me and like 200 guys and uh, um, you know you just quickly became comfortable with that and uh, I, I really never had a problem with it uh, I know that it can lead to problems I did have some um, friendly farmers that wanted me to you know, maybe they wanted to have a date or, you know, go bad. You know, I would get calls in the newsroom, hey, would you like to come and see the uh, the geese landing on my uh, my lagoon? Yeah, the, <laughs> the geese. Uh, the, the the geese, most they, unique pickup line they, ever. <laughs> they land, they take off. It, it'd be great for photos, you know. Sure. Listen, buddy, I, I can't think of anything I would rather do than get in my car, uh, which I'm already in a really rural, remote part of the <laughs> province, and drive to a farm in Nowheresville to watch meet a the strange geese on your lagoon. To meet wink, a wink. strange <laughs> man and be alone with him while I take photos. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry, you know. Um, yeah, no, but thanks for thinking of me. Uh, you know, there were those kinds of situations. Um, I had a bit of uh, a guy uh, got friendly with his hands. I was touring a, a PMU operation. Yeah. Pregnant mare's urine was a, a huge um, issue for a time. They f they built a, 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 a Ayers, Ayers Chemicals, I believe. Uh, they were a pharmaceutical company. They would uh, use pregnant mare's urine in an estrogen treatment for menopausal women. 
and um, they had these farms in and around western Manitoba. And uh, PETA and other groups like that were very unhappy with these farms. Uh, the horses were pregnant and stood for long periods of time with um, uh, a rubber device attached to them mm -hmm. collecting their urine. And there was some kind of a hormone in the pregnant mare's urine that they needed. And then every spring, the horses gave birth and there would be, you know, all these young horses. So I was interested in touring um, a f a an operation to see what it was like. And of course, farmers were anxious to, say, to show that they were humane or they felt they were. So I remember getting going out and walking through this barn and, and uh, I worked alone. I was the reporter photographer at this weekly newspaper. I had a, um, a, a boss and his wife, they lived upstairs. The newspaper office was on the main floor. Um, he ran like a printing press in the back. He made a lot of money printing social tickets. Um, and uh, other flyers and things like that. And then the paper went out every week. And she, the, his wife did the, uh, uh, the mocking up of the paper. And, uh, and I, did, I wrote my stories on a typewriter. And I took pictures and I developed them in a dark room. I mean, this is like antique right now. These are all words the kids are going to have to Google. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, kids. You're going to learn a lot here. Yeah. Anyway, so I would tell them where I was going, and I'd say, yeah, I'm going over to, oh, yeah, I know where that is. You know, it's at this mile marker, whatever. He had mm -hmm. kind of, but it was before cell phones, it was before the Internet. So I'd, I went out to this guy's farm, and I took a tour, but he got pretty, he got, a, he got handsy with me. Yeah. And he was a, uh, a politician, and that made it awkward later when I would cover the meetings. Uh, but I just, you know, I, I had to tell him to kind of where to go and what to do. And this was way before Me Too and even sexual harassment cases and things. This was, this was the 80s. Mm -hmm. And I was young and I just, you know, I, I, we didn't use words like that was inappropriate. We just said, hey, you know, like we tell the guy to back off. And I went back and I told my boss. And um, he just said, well, yeah, I mean, don't be alone with him. You mm -hmm. know, sort of like when you go to the doctor and you say, hurts when I do this. And the doctor says, says don't, don't do, do that. <laughs> so uh, as much as uh, I could, I did my job. Uh, uh, I have, you know, I have an unending curiosity. And you have to go out and you have to see things, right? You can't do it from an office. Exactly. You've got to go out there. And you can't always have somebody with you. So you just learned... Um, you learned how to do things like maybe you weren't comfortable in somebody's house interviewing them. Sometimes I would do interviews in my car. You learn to adapt. And uh, then there were these lovely uh, plunger type devices that could stick to a phone and you'd buy a little micro cassette recorder. I still have mine. It held a, a cassette tape. Then later they would hold the micro cassette tapes. I still have the one that held, held a cassette tape. <laughs> and so you put it in there and you'd hook it up to the phone and you could do a phone interview and record it. Because this was before computers, so you, and then you, and you were trying to write and then you had to type the story. So, you know, the, the, and these were, people did the job way before me, right? Yeah. But um, it was just, so as I've, as, as I've gone through the industry now, I hear people say, Oh, I can't use my computer, or you know, my phone battery is dead. Now I just think, oh, oh you, you kids, you don't know how good you have it these days, right? Yeah. Well, there, there was still there was no um, when I started. There wasn't uh, Facebook. It came a little bit after, um, and so like you you sat there, and it's like, I, like it's so funny now. It's just like I'm trying to remember. Well, how how did we find things out before there was Facebook? Somehow we did. <laughs> I know. It's Somehow true. we knew what was going on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and people would ask. They say, "How did you find out about this?" Like well, somebody told me, or I overheard it, and on the bus, or when I was in a restaurant, you know. Or you picked up and you just cold called. Hey, anything going on? Hey, anything going on? Hey, anything going on? Hey, anything going on? I spent a few hours doing that <laughs> every you Friday did. afternoon. Yeah. You did every morning. You did what we called cop checks. So you called every RCMP detachment in mm. Western Manitoba, and you, this was before they sent out press releases. Yeah. You called them all. And then you and you had to kind of have a spiel because you didn't want to hear about how you know the goat got out here or somebody's cattle you know I mean maybe cattle were being you know rustled or whatever that would be a story but you had to say so I'd say like are there you know are, were there any homicides yeah were there any fatal accidents 
you had to be very specific because you didn't want to waste their time or, or your own time. I, I actually remember that one of the first newsrooms that I interned in, they were saying, call the cops, don't waste your time. Just ask if anybody's dead. <laughs> you know, have there been any deaths? That's, all, that's, that's the only question you need to know. It's cold, but it's, it's what you had to do. And, and a lot of the work we do is similar, I find, to police. I mean, they have their own procedures as we do, but you know, we are often at the same scenes, you know? Because what they cover is often used, mm -hmm. so they, we we kind of have a language that we can at least talk to each other about. So, I mean, it, it, we'll speed up a little bit and go ahead because uh, you went on. You worked uh, at some other papers. You worked at the Winnipeg Sun, among them, and uh, then you made the switch over to broadcast and also onto a different beat. How is that? Huge learning curve really uh, uh, an incredible opportunity but also uh, a way now I had to completely turn what I'd been doing upside down and learned to let the pictures tell the story instead of words and uh, you know a complete new respect for TV right uh, I had worked in print and uh, there were always those TV people around dragging their big cameras but mm -hmm. I, I I didn't know them. I didn't have to understand everything that they went through, and uh, then I became one of them. And um, wow, it's I have a lot of respect for the business now, and uh, been great to work in it. I worked in it for well, I'm in was seven years with Investigates, uh, but yeah, it was like coming into a new country too. You had to learn the language of television. You had to learn. Uh, to be patient, you had to learn to work with others because when you're uh, in print, you're pretty solitary, right? You're one person, you're going out, you're gathering, and you're writing the story. Uh, and TV, it's all collaborative, right? I I would think of the story. We would think of what the story was going to be about. I might I would do the research. I would write the scripts. I would book the travel. But then I would have a camera person with me, right? Yeah. And then the then uh, I have to trust that they're getting what I want and they understand my vision, you know, and then I come back and then I have someone editing the piece. So then you, again, you hope they're, it's going to be true to what, how you want it to look and you can't say, hey, move over, let me do that. You, <laughs> you, you're dependent on them and their skills, right? And you hope they're having a good day and you're buying them lots of sugar. <laughs> so uh, it was, um, and, and, just learning how the language of how to work with people on camera right. right because when it was just me with my notebook that's people don't find that threatening and they kind of like when you're sitting there in rapt attention writing everything down that they're saying well then I I sat here like this I would be looking at them and making eye contact and and nodding and mirroring their body language while a camera was capturing it. So it was another person in the room plus a camera. And as soon as that camera light would go on, you could see people's body language. They, they tense up and they, like, cause I, I don't notice it anymore. Like there's cameras here and like, I just, I just don't. But you forget what a big deal it is for people like to be on camera. Even even now, with like cell phones and Facebook and uh, Facebook Live and everything, it's still intimidating for them to be on camera. Absolutely, and and then I found myself as well worrying like, oh, they're wearing a hat and they're wearing sunglasses, and then you become sort of like, could you take that off? And yet you want things to be natural and happening, you know, organically, and yet you're kind of having to interfere and. And then there were ethical things that would pop up, like, oh, could you do that again for us on camera, you know, where you were make, making mm -hmm. your tea, and they was, and then I'd say to myself, well, wait a minute, I mean, that wasn't happening in the moment, is it okay to film that? Like, it was, it was, it just opened up a whole new universe of journalism, how you do things on camera, and uh, it's, it, it, it stretched my mind, I think, like nothing else, I mean, and it really engaged it. Um, and it made you look at stories, I found anyway, I looked at stories in a very different way. And you had to think like, what am I gonna see? What are people gonna see? Um, and how am I gonna tell that story with photos or, or with video? And um, you know, if, any, if you get the chance, you know, if people are in journalism and they're writing and they get the chance to work in TV, I'd say go for it. I did do a stint in radio beforehand mm -hmm. and I loved radio. 
and it made me a better writer. My writing was tighter and brighter, and then you learn to use sound. Right. And I loved radio, but uh, when radio was changing around the time I was there where they weren't making these packs, these stories with sound, so I'm lucky I got in at the very end when I did, and I, I worked with some amazing people that understand the medium and know how to do it. I did one story, just a quick summer hit where it was a daycare center in Winnipeg in the basement and the kids were sweltering. It was like 38 degrees, wow. no air conditioning. And I just, someone just kept, yelled at me as I was leaving the newsroom, get natural sound. And so I had the mic at the fan. And I used that. I had a, a more senior reporter work with me to cut the story. And it started like that. It was be like, this is a daycare center. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what are you not hearing? You're not hearing the kids running or playing or crying. The sounds you would hear in a daycare center, you're hearing this fan sound, right? Because mm -hmm. the kids were lying on the floor, just heat stroke. <laughs> and they had to go to daycare. Their parents depended on it. They had to go to work. They dropped their kids off. It was a church basement, didn't have air conditioning. Well, the story ran, it was like a minute 10, and the, the phones just went crazy with people. We want to buy them an air conditioner. Wow. You know, so people might be busy driving in their car, at home, whatever they're doing, listening to radio, and they could stop and hear just the, the fan sound of how it stilled these kids in a daycare center. Yeah. So I think of, I mentioned that as an example of what you, you can do very powerfully with, with images, with, with pictures. Right, um, but I had to learn that. And you know, we we can talk about this piece because this is a, a piece on IAP, and here's one where a bit of a challenge for pictures because it's 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 really a story about someone, uh, I guess, getting uh, <laughs> basically getting hosed by lawyers. Um, but you're yeah, you're not capturing it at the moment, right? Uh, t tell me a little bit about this lady and uh, how you met her and what her story was. Sure. Annie Plume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was uh, an 86-year-old elder living in a little ramshackle house on, the, uh, on, on Kainai, the blood reserve, south of Calgary. And I remember it was a hot day, and my cameraman, Josh Grummet, and I, we arrived. Uh, we, we got the story through... Paul Barnsley, the executive producer of Investigates, he had a, a source that he'd worked on a different story who uh, told him this was happening, that elders and other survivors of residential school uh, were being ripped off by lawyers, by a lawyer. And uh, we got to get down there and get this story. And so uh, with the source's help, uh, we uh, were able to reach out to some of the uh, people that were affected and ask them would they do an interview. And she agreed. And we went to her home and we went in and I remember it was so hot mm. that like I, I didn't wear my shoes in the house. My, my f it was just so hot. We were in bare feet. Um, and she sat on the couch and she didn't speak very much English. So her son, Tyrone uh, Weaselhead, uh, translated f the Blackfoot language for us. And she uh, uh, took us back to being five years old and being in residential school and not, g not sitting in a classroom and learning, but being pretty much slave labor. They washed the clothing of the nuns and the other, I, I'm not sure if the school had a priest, but all the religious order that lived and worked there, uh, these little children washed their clothing and, uh, and she worked in the laundry. That was her residential school experience. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how they had to use an iron and it was not an iron that even plugged into the wall. Yeah, one of those ones that you would have heated up in the day and yeah, yeah. S there lots of burns. She would point to her arms and uh, one day she said um, a nurse clock, or sorry, a nun clocked her on the side of the head with her hand, open hand, and damaged her she, ear. And she, I remember Annie Plume moving her hair and showing us the ear and saying it never worked right since then. 
And this is a woman who's 86, so this is something that happened 81 years ago. And she sat there and told us about it. And so we asked her, you know, why did you want to do the interview? Uh, because it, it sounds traumatic to bring that up. And she said, I, I want people to know this and to remember. And she had a lawyer who did not give her good representation. She uh, went to a, what they called a hearing. On it. Everybody received a CEP payment. Um, and then and that was a common experience payment that you get just just because you were in residential school correct. whether or not th there were other things you'd apply for if you're abused but that was the common experience yeah right thanks for that and so then there was the IAP after that the uh, independent assessment process it's about as cumbersome as it sounds and uh, then that those were individually adjudicated hearings which means uh, there was usually a lawyer there from Canada a lawyer there from maybe at one of the churches that was running the res school. There was an adjudicator, which is it was a lawyer, and then there was the the survivor's lawyer. So there'd be in, they'd be in a room with maybe four or five other people. They could bring a support person, but not into the hearing with them. The mm -hmm. support person had to stay out in the hall. And th these were um, hearings where they would then be asked questions like you're asking me about what happened in residential school and they would go through the experience and then they would talk about uh, either very serious physical abuse or sexual abuse and then under the IAP that would be uh, assessed uh, according to a list of harms there was a, a schedule and uh, you know if you uh, had this happen to you you got this many points or that happened to you got that many points and then the points were added up and then that equaled a certain amount of money or financial compensation and uh, you know you and I didn't create the system we just tried to report about it but the people that went through it re said it was very difficult they would be in a room with strangers often not using their first language and have to recall things that happened to them that sometimes they had never told a living soul mm -hmm. and they had long buried and they had and not only did they have to re recall it they had they had to give details about it and I think we all know enough now about people going through trauma or even never mind physically but sexually uh, these things where the mind can bury them very expertly and if you're not with experts that are helping you recall it, it can cause further damage. And so uh, it sounded trite, but a lot of what I reported later would be they felt re-victimized because mm -hmm. it was a way to capture what happened um, to them. And so Annie went to her hearing, um, but her lawyer, uh, you know, I guess for reasons only known to him, I mean, it, the allegation is he did it because he was greedy and, and lazy. Uh, he didn't even really show up at her hearing. He sent a junior lawyer who didn't know anything about her or her case. I don't know if they'd even read her file and um, was basically no help to her. And her uh, claim was rejected. Uh, I don't know if they felt that perhaps what happened to her ear and I don't know what else happened like that was mm -hmm. private in the room so she didn't talk about any sexual abuse with us on television uh, but physically um, you know her ear she had lifelong damage uh, she had other injuries you know burns from the iron and things like that and so uh, her claim was rejected so she wanted people to know that that she did everything right she filled out the forms she got a lawyer she went to the hearing she followed every all the steps she was told to follow and her claim was rejected and that led us to doing the bigger story of all of other problems with this IAP mm -hmm. but her story in and of itself really resonated with people that she was a, a, a tiny like bird-like woman who th through very limited English and her son very lovingly sitting beside her translating the story wanted to have people know what happened and to her. And for you as the reporter, why is it important for you to do that story? Oh my, you know, uh, Canada thinks the, the apology is made up for residential school and now we've moved into an era of reconciliation and hey, we, we've, we've given compensation, we've done everything we're supposed to do, you know, so they say non-Indigenous Canada. 
but hey, wait a minute, non-Indigenous Canada, the systems that you're using, the, your legal system and your lawyers and all these uh, ways you're trying to, to do this redress, sorry, it didn't work and it's not working. And lawyers are taking advantage and, and of using the system for their own gain. Um, and those things have to be reported. That has to be made public that, yes, millions of dollars was spent trying to pay compensation, but of a lot of it went to lawyers. Law firms and individual lawyers made multi-millions of dollars through this class action settlement. And yet someone like Annie Plume, who maybe would have received $5,000 or $10,000, I don't even know if her claim would have registered $20,000 on the physical harms, she didn't get anything. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's important because I know I know people care about residential school survivors and they want to see these wrongs addressed, and yet it's being perpetuated by us by the system. And I guess that's the that that's the the sad thing, but the hope also to kind of end on because it it is that. Um, there is a response to this. There are people who are sitting there and saying that that wasn't fair, that wasn't what we wanted. We want something better. Yeah, and there's other class actions for the day school survivors, for uh, 60 Scoop. There are going to be more, and we need to learn from what happened to rest school survivors and not repeat that. You know, we don't, they don't want to see other survivors go through that same system and be taken advantage of. You know, and we know enough now that we can report that and say, hey, that happened in that settlement. Let's not see that repeat in the next one. Well, and I think you've, you've done a, a huge body of work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you, we go and look you up on the website, like uh, chasing down these stories has been a huge part of your work, and uh, I thank you for it. Yeah, and it was my absolute pleasure, not only my job, but my absolute pleasure to, to do it. Yeah, thanks for talking to me today. Oh, you're welcome.